Awake for the Sake of the Future by Rudolf Steiner, Lecture 11, Realism and Nominalism, the Divine Essence in Nature and the Human Being, drawn up January the 27th, 1923. The medieval intellectual life out of which the modern life of the mind originated, at least as far as Europe is concerned, is found in what is known as scholasticism. At its height, scholasticism contained two well-differentiated streams, realism and nominalism. If you think about the meaning of the word realism in our time, it will not help you to understand the meaning of the term in the context of medieval scholasticism. Today, everything that is outwardly sense-perceptible and can be experienced through its physicality is said to be real, and everything that is not material is considered an illusion. Exactly the opposite was true of medieval realism. According to medieval realism, ideas about objects and processes were related to prototypes and ideals, which were real above all else, whereas the nominalist school thought that language allows us to assign names to things, but words do not stand for something real. Let us see if we can clarify the difference between the realist and nominalist. I have on other occasions turned to the explanation of an old friend, Vincent Noir, to clarify the perception of realism. Whoever accepts only the reality of what comes through our outer senses, that is, what may be found in matter, will not understand what happens if a wolf is held captive over a long period of time and eats only the flesh of a lamb. Knowing that the material substance of a wolf is completely exchanged for new matter in the course of time, it would seem logical that a wolf that eats only meat from lambs would eventually consist entirely of the substance derived from lambs. Thus, the lamb-eating wolf would itself turn into a lamb. But that is not what happens. The wolf remains a wolf. It is not the nature of matter that determines whether an animal is a lamb or a wolf. Rather, it is the essential form or inherent constitution of an animal that determines whether an animal is a lamb or a wolf. Therefore, as human beings, we distinguish between the lamb and the wolf by assigning one concept or idea or form to the lamb and a different one to the wolf. When you say that concepts or ideas are nothing and that only matter distinguishes a lamb from a wolf, then whatever has been part of the lamb and is transferred to the wolf determines if the matter is lamb or wolf. If concepts are meaningless, then in a material sense the wolf must turn into a lamb if it always eats the flesh of a lamb. This is the way in which Vincent Snower demonstrates what was meant by the point of view of a realist steeped in medieval scholasticism. It is the form that identifies the real, not the way in which matter is organised. And the form is a concept or an idea. This was the perspective of the medieval realist who said the concept or idea constitutes what is real, and so they called themselves realists. The nominalists were adamant opponents to the realists. They asserted that there is nothing other than outward sense perceptible reality. Concepts and ideas for the nominalists were nothing more than names by which the things which possess material existence are distinguished. Today, however, if we take the nominalists and compare them to the realists, such as Thomas Aquinas or some other scholastics, characterising their views in abstract terms, the differences regarded as so profound at the time are scarcely negligible. Realism and nominalism seem merely to represent two different points of view. This is because in the present day we are not inwardly moved and warmed by what is expressed in these spiritual streams, but actually there is something very important here. Take the realists who say that universals expressed in ideas, concepts or forms are realities within which the sense perceptible is ordered. For the scholastics, these universals captured in ideas and concepts were already abstractions, except they said that these abstractions were real. However, their abstractions were remnants of an earlier, more concrete and substantial experience of knowing. In earlier eras, human beings did not merely associate the concept of wolf with a material wolf. They actually experienced the presence of the group soul of the wolf in the spiritual world. The group soul was a real being. 
this actual being was experienced and perceived in a much earlier time. But what once had been experienced in the soul had evaporated into an abstract concept by the time of scholasticism. Nevertheless, the realist among the scholastics still retained something of the earlier living perception and knew that a concept was not just a nothing. The concept still contained an element of the real. This reality was a remnant, a residue of real beings. In the late medieval period, one still had an inkling of these real beings, just as the ideas of Plato in ancient times were full of life, and indeed they were much livelier than the medieval experience of ideas of the scholastics. Ancient Persian archangels, known as the Am Shaspans, were also remnants of an earlier era when they too were living beings active throughout the universe. Plato's ideas and Persian archangels were real beings. For Plato, these angelic beings had already become somewhat veiled, and by the time of medieval scholastics, these beings had been reduced to abstractions. That was the last stage of the spiritual clairvoyance that had been carried over from ancient times. Even though the medieval realists among the scholastics no longer had access to an older spiritual perception, the living ideas, the concepts, had been handed down over centuries and preserved the universal reality that still lived in the stones, plants, animals and the physicality of human beings. These ideas, concepts and universals were still regarded as something spiritual, even if they were perceived in the form of an, an elusive, watery, spiritual aspect. The nominalists were already closer to modern intellectualism, for they were no longer capable of seeing ideas or concepts as being connected to anything real. For them, concepts and ideas were just names that brought order into humanity's understanding of material existence. The medieval realism that we find in Thomas Aquinas was not carried over into the world view of the modern era, for concepts and ideas today have no relationship to what is considered real. If you ask someone today if concepts and ideas stand for something real, you could expect to receive an answer only if you reformulated the question. For example, you could ask a human being who had been educated in a modern way, would you be satisfied if you existed only as a concept or an idea after you died? This would make a person feel very unreal after death. In our day, this question would seem to imply something completely unreal about the human being after death. That was not so for the realists among the medieval scholastics. Concepts and ideas were so real for them that they could still believe in the existence of the world all. They could have imagined that after having died they would still continue to exist in the form of a concept or an idea. Medieval realism, as we have already noted, did not continue into modern times. The modern world view is thoroughly nominalist. And people today who no longer trouble themselves about the inner meaning of concepts and ideas are the ones who are most steeped in nominalism. This too has a profound significance. The victory of nominalism as the conventional wisdom in modern civilization means that humanity has lost its capacity to grasp the spiritual aspect inherent within the material world. The family named Smith, for example, now has nothing to do with the person named Smith who stands before us because the connection has been utterly lost between the individual called Smith today and the ancestors who knew why they once had received the name Smith. Similarly, if the universal principle of wolf or lamb is abandoned and wolf and lamb are simply names, then the relationship of the animal to its core reality or its universality is lost as well. In modern civilization, the loss of connection to the spirit may be traced to the transition from realism to nominalism. The difference between the two streams of scholasticism the difference between realism and nominalism has lost its meaning because realism has lost its connection to the spiritual. If I can find the universal idea that grasps the deeper reality of the stone, the plant, the animal or human physicality, then I can raise the question whether these faults live in stones or plants or whether these faults once arose from the divine wisdom that created stones or plants. If I consider ideas and concepts only as if they were names that human beings assign to stones and plants, then I sever the connection between stones and plants with the divine being. And I myself am no longer able to say that I enter a relationship to a divine being. 
If I were a realist in the sense of medieval scholasticism, I would say that I immerse myself in the world of stones, in the world of plants, in the world of the animals. I form within myself thoughts about quartz crystal, the colour vermilion, sulphide of mercury, malachite. I create thoughts within myself about lilies and tulips. I generate thoughts about the wolf, the hyena and the lion. These thoughts are based upon what I perceive with my senses. When these thoughts are also imbued with thoughts about the divine origins of the stones, plants and animals, then I can also contemplate divinity. That is, I create a connection with the divine through my thinking. If I were to stand as a lost, forlorn human being on the earth and hear a faint echo of the lion's roar resounding in the word lion, for I myself have given the lion this name, then my knowledge lacks a connection between the name I gave the lion and the divine spiritual creator of earthly beings. The modern human being has lost the capacity to discover the spiritual in nature and even the last trace of this connection which we could have found in scholastic realism has been lost. When we go back to the times when, through the insight of higher knowledge, humanity recognised the true nature of these things, we see that the ancient mystery schools saw in all things a creative and creating principle, which is known as the Father God principle. Moving from sense perception to suprasensory knowledge, human beings felt as if they encountered the divine Father God principle. The universe was expressed in the ideas and concepts of scholastic realism were the last examples of humanity's search for the Father God principle in the natural realm. Only after scholastic realism lost ground was it possible to speak about atheism in a European civilization. As long as human beings still could discover real, living thoughts within the sense-perceptible world, they could not speak about atheism. To argue that atheists were present among the ancient Greeks is not justified, because the first real atheists appear in modern times. In ancient Greece, however, we do discover the first flashes of an elementary human emotion that became the basis for atheism at a later point in human development. But real, theoretical atheism could emerge only after the collapse of scholastic realism. Even though the mystery of Golgotha occurred 13 or 14 centuries before the height of scholastic realism, the realists still lived strongly under the influence of the divine Father God principle. The mystery of Golgotha could be fully understood only within the context of a much earlier time. But those who understood the mystery of Golgotha in relation to ancient mystery wisdom steeped in the Father God principle would see Christ only as the Son of the Father. Please consider carefully the development of the following ideas. A friend has told you about a man whose name is Miller, and yet all you were told about this man was that this personality named Miller is the son of the old Miller. The only thing you know about the young Miller is that fact that he is the son of the old Miller. Let us say that you want to know more about the son from your friend who knows the son, but your friend just keeps telling you about the characteristics of the old Miller. Finally, your friend concludes by saying once again that the young Miller is the son of the older Miller. Something like this occurred during the time of the mystery of Golgotha. The world of nature owed its existence to the creator Father God and Christ was identified as the son of the Father God. To a great degree, even the realists among the scholastics characterised the Christ simply as the son of the Father, that is, of utmost importance. Then came a reaction to seeing Christ as part of the stream connecting the mystery of Golgotha to the Father God principle. The counterstream, known as Protestantism, emerged during the transition from the medieval to the modern period. One of the most important aspects of Protestantism was its emphasis upon bringing Christ in its own right to the awareness of the believer. The older theology in which Christ was seen primarily as the Son of the Father God was replaced by an interest in the Gospels, the accounts of the deeds of Christ and the words spoken by Christ as an independent being. In the teachings of John Wycliffe at the heart of German Protestantism in the 16th century and in the new directions forged by Johann Amos Comenius lay the task of presenting Christ as an independent, autonomous being. 
But the time had passed when human beings still perceived the spirit in nature and the spiritual origin of things. Nominalism had taken hold of modern mentality and suppressed people's feeling for the spirit, and so human beings no longer look for the divine spiritual in Christ. In the new theology, the divine spiritual was increasingly absent. Christ, as I have often pointed out, even for the theologians, became the humble man of Nazareth. If we look at the book What is Christianity by Adolf von Harnick, we discover a modern theologian returning to an older theological position and identifying Christ once again with the Father God principle. Everywhere in this book it is possible to substitute Father God for any mention of Christ. There is almost no difference between the two in this work. As long as the Father God wisdom encompassed Christ as the Son of God, to a certain extent one could still approach the spiritual reality of Christ. But if one wanted to grasp Christ himself and his individuality as a divine spiritual being, then one had already lost this spiritual perception and could not approach Christ. And as a specific example, it is very interesting to note that Christian Geyer, the senior Lutheran pastor in Nuremberg, once gave a lecture in Basel in which he openly took the position that modern Lutheran theologians do not have a Christ, only the universal God. Geyer said this because he understood that wherever there was talk about Christ, it was in fact only an expression of the Father God principle. This is related to the fact that the human being who could still perceive the spirit in nature could actually discover only the Father God principle in nature. Since the collapse of scholastic realism, even seeing the Father God in nature was no longer possible. As soon as one can no longer find the spiritual in the Father God principle, atheistic perspectives appear. But if we wish to go beyond seeing Christ merely as the Son of God, if we wish to grasp this Son in his own being, then we must see him not only as a human being who is born like all other human beings, we must ourselves experience him in an inner way, even when initially this inward deepening appears as a dimly perceived awakening. It will be necessary to proceed through the following stages of consciousness. You must say to yourself that if you simply remain the human being you were by nature at birth, if you continue to see with your eyes just as you saw the day you were born, if you continue to only perceive with your senses what nature reveals to you, if you continue to be led by your intellect as you try to penetrate beneath the outer face of nature, then you will never attain your full humanity. You will not be able to feel your full humanity or to discover all of the capacities available to you as a human being. To do that, you must awaken within yourself the capacities that lie deep within you. You must not be satisfied with the legacy you received at birth. You must in full consciousness bring forth what exists as nascent capacities within the depths of your being. Today, if we only attempt to educate the unconcealed gifts of the human being, we will not enable the child to take hold of its full humanity. In order to tap all of the capacities living in the human being, we must encourage and teach each human being to search the depths of his or her being, and to draw forth out of one's innermost being the inner light that, once it has been lit, will accompany us throughout earthly life. How did this come about? It came about because Christ went through the mystery of Golgotha. He is united with the life of the earth, and also lives within the depths of the human being. When individually each one of us takes on the task of inner self-awakening, we also can experience the living Christ. Christ is not found through the ordinary consciousness with which we were born, or which we have developed in the course of our lives. Christ has to be brought up from the depths of the human soul. The consciousness of Christ first occurs in a, as an event in the life of soul. Thus you really can say, as I have often expressed it, that the human being who does not find the Father God was in some way born into deficient circumstances and is not entirely healthy. To be an atheist means that a person is in some way physically ill. Not to find Christ, however, is a question of destiny, not of ill health, for finding Christ is an experience, not a reflection of one's physical constitution. We find the Father God principle because we are able to see him everywhere in the nature. An individual finds Christ through an experience of inner resurrection, an experience of rebirth. 
Christ becomes part of the experience of rebirth as an independent being, not simply as the son of the Father. Thus we are able to understand that if as human beings in the modern era we were to cling only to the Father God, we would not be able to enter into our full humanity. This is the reason that the Father sent his Son. It is through the Son that the work of the Father on earth can be fulfilled. Can you understand now why in order to fulfill the purposes of the Father God, Christ had to be an independent being? In the present age, it is only through spiritual science that we are able to understand the process leading to inner awakening in a practical, experiential and living way. Spiritual science supports the experiences drawn out of soul depths as conscious knowledge, which sheds light upon the encounter with Christ. To summarise this, I wish to remind you that during the course of scholastic realism, the possibility of expanding further the principle of knowing the Father God was exhausted. In every form of realism, the spirit is recognised as something real. Realism, within the context of anthroposophy, shows that the sun at last can be recognised as an independent being. This enables us to find the divine spiritual in an independent way as we encounter the Christ. The Father God principle played the greatest role imaginable over a long period of time. Medieval theology, which grew out of ancient mystery wisdom, was interested only in the Father God principle. What questions resulted from this? Did the Father and the Son both exist throughout eternity, or was the Son born in the course of time? There was even interest in the genealogy of the Father. Everywhere in the history of dogma, great emphasis was placed upon the genealogy of Christ. When the Spirit was added to the Father and the Son, once again the question was raised whether the Spirit existed with the Father and the Son, or if the Spirit arose out of the Father or the Son, and so forth. Theologians constantly explored the genealogy of the three divine persons, for the continuing interest in the divine lineage was rooted in the Father God principle. When the strife between scholastic realism and nominalism was at its height, the old concepts about the lineage of the Son from the Father and the lineage of the Spirit through the Father and the Son were no longer understood. You see, Three divine beings were identified, and yet these three divine persons were supposed to form a single God. The realists drew the three divine persons into one idea. For them, the composite idea was real. A single God was a reality in their understanding. The nominalists could not accept the possibility of a single God made up of three persons. They recognised the Father, Son and Spirit, but to combine them into a unity was simply creating a word or name that deny the integrity of the three persons. During the time of the controversy between the realists and nominalists over the Godhead, it was not possible to come to an agreement about the divine trinity. A living formulation of the threefold divinity could no longer be sustained. After nominalism triumphed over realism, no one knew how to reconcile the individual persons of the Godhead. People went back to whichever tradition they were inclined to accept, but they could not think the matter through with clarity. The Lutheran confession placed Christ in the foreground, but because Lutherians were under the influence of nominalism, they could not grasp the divine spiritual individuality of Christ. One simply did not know how to understand the concept of the three divine persons. The old dogma of the threefold nature of the divine was left dangling. These things were of great importance to human beings during the time when spiritual feelings were inwardly experienced and contributed to the happiness or misfortune of human souls. But these things have been pushed into the background by the Philistinism of modern times. What does it matter today if a modern person is pulled into the theological controversy about the relationship among the Father God, Son and Spirit? People now can hardly imagine why this question was ever a burning issue for human souls. The modern person has become a philistine, that is, an individual who has no true feeling experience of an awakening spirituality. This person lives entirely within the sphere of habit. Without the presence of the spirit it is impossible to experience the fullness of one's humanity. The Philistine prefers to live without the spirit, to wake up without the spirit, to eat breakfast without the spirit, to go to the office without the spirit, 
to eat midday without the spirit, to play billiards without the spirit, and so forth. The narrow-minded individual wants to do everything without the spirit. Nevertheless, throughout one's life, the spirit unconsciously accompanies every human being. In the case of the Philistine, however, the presence of the spirit is of no interest. In this regard, it may seem as if anthroposophy ought to uphold the ideal of the universal divine. Anthroposophy, however, does not do this, for an anthroposophist recognises the divine spiritual in the Father God, and separately from this also recognises the divine spiritual in the Son of God. If we compare the earlier approach to knowing the Father God with the anthroposophic approach, we notice that, above all, the knowledge of the Father God posed the following question about Christ. Who is his Father? If we can show who the Father is, then we shall have the knowledge of the Father. If we know who the Father is, then we can presume that through the Father we shall also gain knowledge of Christ. Of course, we must remember that anthroposophy is rooted in modern life. As we have extended our knowledge of nature, so too we have amplified our knowledge of the Father God. But if we wish to develop a knowledge of Christ, this knowledge arises solely out of his person. To accomplish this, we must study history, trace the descent and the unfolding of history, discover the mystery of Golgotha at its deepest point, and then follow the subsequent ascent in human development. By studying nature, anthroposophy allows the Father God principle to be resurrected anew. By studying history, anthroposophy discovers Christ. These are the two different paths by which we come to know both the Father and the Son. It is as if you travel to City A and meet there an older man, and then go to City B and become acquainted with a younger man. Thus I learn about the older man and the younger man, each as separate persons. Each of the two interests me. Afterwards it occurs to me that the two have a certain similarity. As I consider this similarity, I soon realise that the younger one is the son of the older one. The same thing occurs in anthroposophy. You encounter Christ, you discover the Father. Afterwards, you learn about the relationship between the two. Whereas the ancient wisdom about the Father God flowed out from the Father, and you arrived at an understanding of the relationship between the Father and the Son out of its common origins. You can see that anthroposophy forges a new path and you have to be ready to transform your thinking and feeling if you wish to enter into anthroposophy. It is not helpful to anthroposophy if anthroposophists consider the anthroposophic worldview as if it were more or less like a materialistic perspective or as more or less in accord with older traditional forms of knowledge. Then they espouse an approach such as anthroposophy because that position is more pleasing to them than one of the other world views. That is not the point at issue. You must not move back and forth from one perspective to another, that is from a materialist, monastic point of view to an anthroposophic perspective, and say to yourself that now the anthroposophic position speaks to you more fully than the other viewpoints. Rather, you have to acknowledge that the capacity that allows you to understand the monistic, materialistic model is not capable of enabling you to understand anthroposophic insights. The Theosophists have believed that the perspective of a materialistic, monistic image enables them to perceive the spiritual. Holding this unusual perspective allows them to describe the monistic, materialistic worldview. Everything is matter. The human being also consists entirely of matter. The substance of nerves, blood and so forth is matter. The Theosophists, and I am referring to the members of the Theosophical Society, say that no, that is a materialistic perspective, spirit also exists. Then they begin to describe the human being according to the spirit. The physical body is solid, the etheric body is somewhat thinner, rather like a thin fog. Both of these are materialistic representations. The astral body is even thinner, but it is still a material substance. Then a ladder reaches a still thinner matter that is called spirit. This is also materialism. It is just that the matter becomes thinner and thinner. Materialism is at least honest and calls what is material matter. But the Theosophists present what is material and call it spirit. You have to acknowledge that it is necessary to transform your thinking to learn to imagine the spiritual in a way 
other than the manner in which you form an imagination of the material. The Theosophical Society in one way looks at history in an especially interesting way. Materialists speak about atoms. Atoms can be described in very different way. Materialists who take into account the material qualities of these bodies have created a number of different images of atoms. Among them there is a theory of the atom in which atoms are portrayed as making a swinging motion back and forth as if they were made of very thin matter that moves in spiral forms. When you read what Ledbetter says about atoms you will recognise this portrayal. Recently in an article printed in an English newspaper the question was raised whether Ledbetter had actually seen this phenomenon or whether he was speaking out of occult observation that is whether he had read the book describing this and then translated it spiritually. We have to take these things seriously. We ourselves have to examine whether we still cling to materialism and merely assign spiritual names to matter. A transformation of thinking and feeling is required if we wish to achieve a spiritual world view. When we attain that we can gain a perspective derived from a practice through which we may strive through our own efforts to rise beyond the intellectual fall instead of succumbing to it ourselves.